stand by while NCLA cuts through the noise to signal abuse of administrative power. This is Administrative Static with Mark Chenoweth and John Vecchione. Welcome to Administrative Static. This is John Vecchione. I'm here with Mark Chenoweth, and we are joined uh, by Cara Rollins, our colleague, to discuss that uh, we won't have Commissioner Wilson to kick around anymore, huh? Carol, what's no, going on? No, I mean, I, I'll start where she sort of ended her, her resignation letter, a noisy exit. Um, for those that aren't aware, Commissioner Wilson was the, the sole remaining Republican uh, commissioner on the Federal Trade Commission earlier this week in a uh, editorial on the Wall Street Journal. She announced her resignation. Um, and there's also then a companion editorial from the Wall Street Journal's editorial board sort of contextualizing what she said a little bit further. So I think she's been thinking about it for a while. If you get that level of coordination going. But um, one thing, and it's certainly observers of the FTC have noticed this for a while. She paints a picture of a deeply dysfunctional commission uh, to the point that she felt that her only option was to resign and to resign in such a way that it would draw attention to what sort of the significant problems are at the commission right now. And those problems are not just outcomes. They, they have to do with due process and, and with changes in how the commission does its job. Yeah, that, that's correct. So I think one of the things that it's been a critique of the commission um, for the past couple of years, the, the chair right now, Lena Khan. Um, who, who, let's remember, was not appointed chair originally. She was nominated to just be a commissioner. She got through the Senate and only then did the president two days later. as the chairman. Yeah, and that, so that was clearly a, from the get-go, this was a I, setup. I always say that if um, if any producer of anything had uh, had that amount of deception, Lena Khan would bring a case against them. Yeah, yeah for sure. Well, and that's, and that's sort of historically, that's the way it was done. To the extent that somebody was going to be appointed chair, that would be noted in the nomination process because it's so different. The chair drives what's going on. And Lena Khan sort of rose to fame. I, I still think that this is wild. The reason she is the darling that she is of the regulatory state is she wrote a law review article when she was in law school about antitrust in the concept of like related to big tech. And that has been her entire driving goal for I'm assuming the next 10, 15 years of her life. And that that's what gave her the ability to head an enormous agency, which has unbelievable amounts of funds and power, is she wrote a law review article. And, and really no management experience to speak of. No management. I, she's younger than me. And I'm I'm younger than both of you by, yeah, by, by giving them out. <laughs> we don't have to say. Yeah. <laughs> we'll just we'll leave it for folks to wonder. But that is that's that that um that is true. But really the the thing that's going on here whatever her views are antitrust about are. Mm -hmm. um, and I think her views in antitrust are losing in the courts so far. Oh, um, yeah. Because I think I've, I've spoken about this before. If you want to have a, an antitrust revolution and go back to the pre-Borkian uh, mm -hmm. status. You pre Chicago, to, I like to say. Yeah, but okay, pre-Chicago, pre but before the antitrust paradox certainly became standard. Um, I think you have to have a lot more intellectual heft and groundwork. I don't think you can just say, like, you know, Picard, make it so. You, well, you've got you've and, got to have some stuff there. And to that point, I mean. Well, she wrote a law review article, John. Didn't you hear <laughs> yeah, what Karen that's, said? That's the start. I, I understand <laughs> but, that. But, I, you know, and I, I think that this comes through in, in Commissioner Wilson's resignation letter is um, there's a lot of consolidations of power. There's a lot of pushing the outer bounds, not just of antitrust law, because the commission also hands, con handles consumer protection, deception. Um, they are trying to now regulate in the digital space and online and privacy, which they have some statutory authority to do, certainly in, in children's privacy protections. But as to privacy writ large, they have no statutory authority to do. They've signaled that they want to do that. And what you're seeing, I think, is Lena Khan's got a real uh, Icarus problem. She's going to fly so close to the sun because she thinks she can and her wings are going to melt and it might take down the whole commission. That's sort of the thrust of 
um, what some other commentators, including the Wall Street Journal, hint at, and Professor Joshua Wright, who is a former commissioner himself, is the courts are looking at the commission and its power right now and whether or not it is lawfully constructed. And it's not a good look to have people openly questioning whether or not you have power to do what you do, and then to take your position and be like, we're going to push the outer bounds. Yeah, if you're living in a house of glass, maybe you shouldn't throw stones from the inside. inside. Yeah. Right? And, right? I'm and just saying. The other, th the other thing uh, Commissioner Wilson points out, that I, that the, the uh, contentment of the staff on their jobs in these surveys has dropped enormously. And the FTC usually has, I mean, it's, this is against interest, I suppose, for you and me, but they have a pretty competent group of people over there. Yeah, yeah, certainly. And you have, you see folks that when we've been in actions with them, right. folks spend 20, 30 years of their career there. I mean, for DC, that's a long time to be in the same place. And it suggests that there's satisfaction in what they're doing and belief in the mission. And to the extent that you want the government to operating optimally, I think that that's something important that they should be doing. Yeah, I, I, I want to say it went from like 80% staff satisfaction down to 50%. Yeah. Um, and what you see the way Commissioner Wilson in sort of pulling, you know, no punches, calls the staff around her, uh, Chair Khan enablers, and that there's no pushback on anything she's doing. It sounds like it's a bunch of yes men. It sounds like the other Democratic commissioners are just going along with all of this. And I think that if, you know, all of that's percolating, but the straw that broke the back is probably the meadow within um, acquisition. And so the background on that is, is that at some point, if I understand the history correctly, Chairman Khan, while she was not at the commission, had essentially written a letter that suggested or, an, a, you know, an editorial that suggested that Meta as a just strict rule, Meta, which is the parent company of Facebook and, and Instagram and all those others. Let's call it Facebook. We'll call it Facebook. Facebook's a little bit easier. Should not be able to do any further acquisitions at all. Bar none. And so now if you're in charge of antitrust and reviewing whether or not acquisitions are okay, she has prejudged every acquisition that Meta, Facebook, Instagram tries to do and has made it clear that she thinks that they should not be doing that. And so with, big, big is bad. Is, big is, big is bad. Regardless yeah. of what else is going on. And, and so the, the point that I think the straw that broke the, you know, Commissioner Wilson's back on this whole thing is there is, the FTC is now going against Meta for this acquisition of Within, which I believe is some sort of virtual reality um, tool program company. And Commissioner, video game. or video game something, yeah. But Commissioner Wilson said that Chair Khan, because she had, had taken this position that Meta should never be able to do an acquisition, cannot be part of the panel that decides this case. She's got a clear conflict of interest that's going to deprive them of their due process rights. And she wrote a lengthy dissent on this. Obviously, Chair Khan and her enablers, as she calls them, are letting this go forward. She's going to sit in on this hearing. She's going to make determinations about this acquisition. Um, and they heavily redacted, the other two Democratic commissioners heavily redacted the dissent, which Commissioner Wilson also points out historically has not happened. Heavily redacted her dissent? Her yeah. dissent, yeah. Well, I would say publish that in the Wall Street Journal. I mean, that's ridiculous. They can't do that. Yeah, I mean, that's sort of, I, I don't know. This town leaks like a sieve, so yeah. I imagine it's only a matter of time before yeah. everybody sees what's behind the blackout. But what they normally did, they did redact things because the FTC does get confidential information from people. So they would redact that stuff all the time. Um, I That wouldn't have gotten put in the dissent right. in the first place, Correct. I suspect. Correct. So, um you know, and, and it's not just, we don't really, um, we can bits about antitrust, but we don't really mm -hmm. do it uh, directly. Uh, maybe some amicus briefs here and there, but. but um, Once the, upon a time in my youth. Me too. <laughs> but the, Everybody the, dabbles in antitrust. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, but the, the thing is, um, there's still unfairness, deception. There's all these other type of cases. Um, and because uh, of this of the statute the FTC basically says it can do anything anywhere mm -hmm. um, and there really is a problem with cabining what they're allowed to do the one thing about data privacy is is that um, that area the states have acted but Congress hasn't mm -hmm. acted and 
their story on that is that look, this is unfair when your stuff is when you're being tracked and you're you, not being told. And, oh, yeah. You're not being told and all this. And they say that's totally unfair. And we've said that's unfair in other contexts, right? right? So they say for a long time we said other people can't do that. So why can't data people do it? Mm-hmm. And I think that's their argument. But I I think that the main thing is that they can just point to the statute and anything they don't like is unfair. Yeah, I mean, well, we've talked about this before. I mean, the, the FTC Act is, is relatively squishy and standardless, it, it, even amongst the uh, other statutes. But one of the other things that Professor Wright, who again is a former FTC commissioner, raises is this whole thing, and particularly what is going on with Chair Khan, is FTC trades a lot. Not, not to be confused with Sherrick Khan from the <laughs> yeah. Jungle Book. That's right. Yeah. I'm about to say, he's <laughs> not fighting Baloo. <laughs> um, is that the, yes. the yes. FTC trades heavily on its reputational capital, and that's gone. It's just gone. It's gone before the courts. It's gone before public impression, and it's only a matter of time before it goes before Congress. And that's where I think the real trouble starts brewing for them because – you know, there at least was this farce for a while that because there was a mixture of Republicans and Democrats, um, it's a collegial body, there's dissents, and people are having these conversations, and they're hammering out policy in, in a sort of legislative way. Um, it's not just getting dictated that the FTC is sort of okay as an, you know, an right. entity doesn't create problems. And that's gone. It's just I, I hope so. I wonder, I, I, I was, I was, I saw that, but I'm not so sure that the courts are there yet. I hope we, I hope we'll help them get there because um, it is, it is true that they do go in there and I, I say this all the time. They say, well, the FTC, we decided this already, Your Honor. Look, we got these consent judgments. That's the law. Those yeah. aren't the law. So, uh, all right. Any wrap up thoughts? No, I mean, I, I, I think that, you know, we'll look to Congress to see the, the, have the two opening Republican seats, whether they do those appointments will help um, those go through in the Senate. Only time will tell. All right, we'll be back in a little bit. Thank you. Welcome back to Administrative Static. Mark Chenoweth and John Vecchioni with you. And, and John, I wanted to, uh, to talk about another federal agency, the Department of Education, uh, that uh, has, has been on a real tear uh, recently with uh, plans to cancel student loan debt. And I think folks are familiar, and we've talked on this program about the cases that uh, both that NCLA has brought in the District of Kansas, as well as the cases that have made their way up to the U.S. Supreme Court now. Uh, but, but the U.S. Department of Education is not uh, satisfied with those illegal methods of student loan can- debt cancellation. So it has, it has uh, uh, come up with some additional illegal modes of student loan debt cancellation. And there was an opportunity this week for NCLA to file comments with the Department of Education explaining what it was doing wrong and why it was illegal. And the person who led that effort for us was Shang Lee. And Shang, I believe, is on the line uh, with us now. Uh, Shang, welcome to Administrative Static. Thank you, Mark. Uh, so, Shang, uh, tell us, what, what is this new program that the Department of Education uh, is proposing? They have this, this proposed rule on improving income-driven repayment for the William D. Ford Federal Direct Loan Program. What what is this proposed rule, and, and why is it? Yeah, to give it a little background, uh, income-driven repayment comes from uh, a law that Congress passed and revised a couple times, which sets a, a, a borrower's monthly payment based on the borrower's income, and that, that amount is passed, set by Congress, to be 10% of the borrower's income above uh, 150% of the poverty line. So, so you know, yeah. a certain proportion of your discretionary income has to be used to pay loans. And uh, what the department is proposing is 
to lower that cap dramatically to just 5% of income, of income and, and above 225% of the poverty of the line. line. So your, so your, your monthly cap is going to be much lower. lower. And this and is this going to be combined, combined with uh, a, forgiveness a forgiveness at the end of 20, 20 years, years of payment. So if, so your, if your payment, payment is really is low, low, then you then can imagine there's going to be a lot, lot more left over, over at the end of 20 years, years to be canceled. And, that, and that's, that's sort of the sort of thrust of uh, the, the, the department's uh, uh, proposal, proposal. And, and, and this and is estimated, estimated to essentially convert, convert most, most student loans into, into a, a partial, partial or full, full uh, grant program, program. And, and the department the itself estimates, estimates this will cost over $100 billion, dollars. And, uh, and, and more, more better estimates that, that, that take into account kind of the perverse incentives estimate that, that, uh, that this could cost between three and four hundred billion dollars in cancellation over the next uh, next decade. There's a couple so, other aspects to this rule, but but that uh, the biggest uh, the biggest chunk uh, and the biggest cost uh, component. Absolutely. So does the Department of Education have the statutory authority to do this? Well, absolutely not. The, the Congress, Congress again, again set that statutorily those those, those uh, payment, payment caps. caps. What the, the department has is attempting to do now caps. is uh, uh, what it has done a lot of times, which is search back, back for a really, really old law that has some vague language that then the department can twist and torture and say, "Aha, this could be read to give us even greater authority." And so the law they settle up here is uh, uh, 1993 amendment to the Higher, Higher Education, Education Act. Act. And those amendments really were passed to uh, authorize for the first time federal uh, direct lending to borrowers. Before that, it was uh, loans to subsidize to private lenders. Um, and, and there's one provision in there that says, well, there's an income contingent repayment program that we want the secretary to set up. We're not exactly sure what, what it would mean, uh, and we think there's there's a uh, uh, it, but it should be based on the on the borrower's income. And it's very vague, and uh, the con uh, department seized upon that vague language to say, "Aha, we're actually not bound by Congress's more recent thresholds because decades ago." Uh, there's, this, there's this language that says we can we can base income repayment plan on, on income. As long as there's some, some sort of sort relationship, of anything goes. And, and, and under, under this, this reading, uh, uh, nothing, nothing really prevents really the department, uh, uh, nothing, nothing limits the department's uh, discretion. Uh, could, could, the department could say, could say well, well, your, your payment, payment cap is just 1% of your income, your income over a million dollars a year. I mean, that's, that's related to your, your income, isn't it? And, and, and of course, under that view, view, under that meeting, meeting no, one no one would be paying, paying back anything, anything and everything would be forgiven. forgiven. I have a question. Is this on top of the loan forgiveness they're already trying that's holed up, or is it is it duplicative of it? Oh, it's oh, on top of it. The loan forgiveness they're trying to do that's before the Supreme Court is to wipe out loans that people currently have. Uh, what this does is then after that's wiped out, uh, whatever's, whatever's remaining, people, people will be put on a very generous repayment plan where, 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 where folks, folks will be paying barely anything each month, and then and after then 20 years, yeah, whatever's, whatever's left, left over will be forgiven on the back end. Yeah, it's 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 unbelievable, right? I that, can't believe yeah, it. That's true. I thought maybe they were going around and this was duplicative, but it's on top of so it's 500 billion for the other unlawful uh, loan forgiveness, and then it's it's up to 300. Three, I mean, that, well, over a 10-year span, the Wharton School estimates yeah. the cost of Treasury between 333 and 361 billion dollars for this other plan. So you're you're looking at 861 billion dollars. You're getting pretty close to a trillion, John. Know, 100 billion here, 100 billion there. It adds up. Yeah, you yeah. money. I think when that quote was first invented, it was 100 million <laughs> yeah, there. Yeah, exactly. Uh, then it's just that's that's hardly a drop in the bucket now. So what else can you tell us about? This program, or, or maybe, uh, what did NCLA tell the department about why this is? So, well, NCLA explained to the department why its interpretation of that 1993 law is uh, incorrect. Because if you look back at the 1993 lawmaking, uh, there's actually no explicit authorization for the department to cancel even a dime. Nor did Congress in 1993 appropriate a dime to pay for that cancellation. 
and it was understood by everyone at the time that the that the income repayment program, the 1993 program, would generally be cost neutral in the long run. In fact, a Clinton uh, administration official told Congress, "Well, it's not a free ride for anybody because even though they have lower monthly payments, they'll be paying. Uh, you know, the interest will be accruing, and eventually things will be paid off." And, and there and was some understanding, I think, that, that, that some, some proportion of loans will be bad, bad when the government, the government will have to write it off. off. But that's but true that's with any loan. loan. You know, you some, know some, some portion some of home mortgage loans, loan, some, some portion of private student loans, loans are ultimately are written, written off. off. Yeah, let me, and, let me, and that's just a second, I, I Shane, because I, that, I, I think it's no an authorization to cancel it. I think there's an important point there, Shane, that we should focus on, which is, as you say, there's always going to be some loans that are bad that you can't collect. But there's a big difference between telling the department, you need to go try to collect all of the loans. We recognize that at some point, some of the loans will be deemed uncollectible and therefore bad loans. There's a big difference between that and just saying you have the authority to just cancel loans without even trying to collect them. And they're essentially yeah. saying is they're taking statutory authority that said, hey, we recognize that at some point some loans will be bad, and they're trying to use that to say, you can just cancel these loans. Yeah, and that, that's, that's right, Mark. That's a, that's huge, a huge difference. difference. And, and especially, especially we know that Congress, Congress knows, knows how to write right. Uh, cancellation, cancellation language. language. Congress, Congress did write cancellation language, language. Uh, uh, first in 2007 when it, when it explicitly said, uh, uh, you know, you know We'll cancel loans and do this other repayment plan that's capped at the threshold that Congress uh, set. And then in 2010, when Congress reduced those uh, thresholds to make it slightly more generous. Uh, but, but, but Congress's actions in 2007 and 2010 tell us that Congress, this is a role for Congress setting forth, you know, the terms of cancellation and repayment thresholds, not for the department. Why would Congress set these specific limits? If, if the department, through this other, other really, really old and vague 1993, 1993 law, already, already can set whatever set limits, limits it wants. Right. Yeah, we see uh, we see more and more, this administration particularly, but uh, agencies generally rummaging around old statutes, uh, trying to find authority that Congress never really uh, gave to the agency. So, so what's wrong with this, uh, Shang? What does it matter if the agency uh, cancels this debt without... Uh, without appropriations authority from or, or other statutory authority from Congress? Well, there's a couple. I think it, it, it inflicts real constitutional harm. Uh, for one, this would be the agency rewriting laws and overriding Congress's thresholds, which uh, Article One of the Constitution says that sort of legislative power uh, belongs only in the hands of Congress. And not in executive officials. So and, and it it word, because, oh, sorry, Mark, go ahead. I was just saying, self-government is out the window if uh, if the unelected people are the ones rewriting the law. Right, precisely, because these are you know, Secretary Cardona was not elected by anybody. Uh, and what's worse is that is that uh, the Constitution not only gives Congress exclusive power over legislation, but gives Congress exclusive power of the purse. That is, to appropriate funds to pay for. Uh, debt, uh, relief debt relief program. program. So even, even if, if Congress, Congress authorized some sort of major debt, debt relief program of this sort, you, you still need Congress to authorize the funds to pay for it. And here, here Congress, Congress hasn't authorized anything. anything. And, 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 and sort of the power, the power of the purse is really person the most person sacred person thing uh, that, that the founders decided to put in the hands of elected officials because it's, uh, you know, taxpayers' money being used. And the department, the unelected bureaucrats are now committing 300, 300, over $300, 300 billion, billion dollars of taxpayer, taxpayer money, money to pay for this debt relief program, program which, by the way, uh, uh, goes so mostly to well-to-do well -to -do college, college graduates. graduates. That's right. So uh, we only have about 30 seconds left, Shang. What happens now? So the, the, the rule has been proposed. Uh, comments have been filed. Uh, what, what do we expect to happen now? Well, we hope this warning across the bow will deter the department from uh, promulgating this rule. Uh, but uh, if they persist in, do, in doing so, uh, uh, NCLA stands ready to file a lawsuit to, to stop this uh, loan cancellation program the same way we've been doing uh, in, in the other programs. Great. Thanks for being with us, Shane, and telling our audience about this effort.